I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles tonight to the book of Psalms chapter 23. Psalms chapter 23. I realize this is a very, very, very familiar portion of scripture tonight. But I want to look into one verse for our thought tonight. Of course, David is speaking... <clears throat> As, as everyone knows, David is, is, uh, has been a shepherd, grew up as a shepherd boy. So I think some of the greatest teaching times that David ever had in his life was when he was a boy and uh, was put in charge of some sheep. Uh, later, he would be put in charge of what some believe to be two to three million people. And so he learned some very, very valuable lessons dealing with sheep. Uh, of course, he said in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley, here it is, to the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Some time ago, some months ago, we preached from this psalm, on that little word, thee, nine times in this chapter, thee. Uh, thee is a very descriptive word. It identifies a particular thing. When I say a pulpit, there's one here, there's one here. But when I say the pulpit, I'm specifying this one. And so there, there are some lessons here. We're not going to go over those things again. But he says, the Lord, the still waters, the paths, and so forth and so forth. But nine times in this chapter, he specifies. And each one has, has a significance in our lives. But tonight, I want to look at verse number four. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. We've been talking several weeks now on some shadows of the Bible. We started out in Acts chapter 5. We looked at the shadow of Simon Peter. We looked at the personal influence of his life. Can I say it again? Every one of you are influencing someone, either for the good or the bad. Everybody has influence. So there's a shadow. They, they would bring people out and, so they could at least get them in the shadow when Peter walked by. Uh, then we went to Psalms chapter 91. Being under the shadow of the wing of the Almighty. That divine protection that God has. We, we looked at that a few weeks ago. Last Wednesday night, in Jeremiah chapter 6, we saw that the Shadows were lengthening in Jeremiah. He'd preached the prophecy of the judgment of God coming. And when he made that statement, in verses 1 through 4, he says the shadows are lengthening. What, what's going on is the sun's going down. As the sun goes down, the longer the shadows get. In other words, time is running out. You've got so much time. And, of course, they experienced that declared prophecy. But here in chapter 23 of Psalms, we get another look of a shadow. In this verse, the Bible says, and it talks about the valley of the shadow of death. For, and I do this often in, in studying, I, I, I look up, I've got a Bible program, and, it, and, and by the way, those things are tremendous. I, I, I will never forget the, uh, the day that Tom... Or, excuse me, John O'Malley. Uh, he was pastoring in the valley, and I was pastoring in Opelika. He, uh, the church had a computer, 
Uh, and, it, you know, it was just when they first came out. That's when, that's when the basic computer cost three and $4,000. Of course, the church had bought it before I got there. But anyway, it had been sitting up in the corner. Somebody, they, they didn't use it. So. But anyway, John O'Malley came and said, I, I, wanna, I want you to get, I want you to, I want, I want you to learn to use this computer. And, and I reached over and I pulled out that, about a 50 pound Strong's Concordance, you know. Been using it for years and years. I said, John, I appreciate it. So he's younger than I am. And I said, I appreciate it, but I, 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 I look up. He said, if you'll just give me, and anyway, long story short, he talked me into getting a Bible program put on that computer and uh, push a button and boy, all of a sudden, whew, information. And I remember reaching back over and picking up that Strong's concordance, concordance and, and then looked down and pressing one key and I said, you know what? I, I'm going to have to move up a notch here. I can't. So ever since then, long story short, ever since then I've been using a computer. Well, the other day I, I put this phrase in my, in my program, the shadow of death. Now maybe some of you have already done this. But you know that phrase is found 19 times in the Word of God. I, it shocked me. I thought, I thought maybe once here, of course I was very familiar with Psalms 23, but one time. But, and I'm not going to take time to read all these verses, but I will mention them. There. It's found 10 times in the book of Job. 310, 10, 21, and 22, 12, 22, 16, 16, uh, 24, uh, 17, twice in that verse. And I'm talking about the phrase now, the shadow of death, 34, 22, 38, 70, 10 times it talks about the shadow of death. Psalms 23, 4, of course, as we just read, 44, 19, uh, 107, verse 10, and 14, four times in the book of Psalms, one time in the book of Isaiah 9 and 2, two times in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 6, and 13, 16. One time in the book of Amos, chapter 5, and verse 8. And this is what really got a hold to me right here. It's found one time in the New Testament. I'm talking about the phrase, the shadow of death. It's found one time, and I want to read that verse, in Luke chapter 1, verse 79. Of course, we're in the middle of Zechariah's prophecy here. That's, Zechariah was the dad of John the Baptist. You, you remember that. Well, he's blessing the Lord now, and of course he's got his voice back, and he named him John. You know that story. But in, in the midst of that prophecy, he says in verse 79, let me read it to you. He says, to give light to them that sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Wow. Of course, he's talking about the promise of Christ coming and so forth, and, and uh, his son would be the, you know, the forerunner of Christ. And, but but what, I, what I'm saying is we, we, have, we have significant significant information in the Scripture concerning the shadow of death. Is that just a phrase, or does it have some? I think it has something for us. Matter of fact, I called Brother Mike Raglan the other morning. I, was talking, I, I call him, try to call him often and check on Miss Debbie and, and uh, of course, as preachers do, we get to preaching to one another. And by the way, I like that. As the Bible said, iron, brother, brother Wayne said, and I do the same thing, iron sharpeneth iron. See, preachers, we need, we need, we need each other. We need to, you know. And, uh, but anyway, he said, brother, I, I, for some reason I brought this thought up. I'd, I'd been thinking about preaching. I wasn't sure. But I brought it up. He said, you know, brother, Dan said, uh, let me share this with you. He said some years ago, I don't forget how long it's been, but he had been to Israel, I don't know how many times, but he said one time he's there. And the guide said, I want to take y'all somewhere today that you might never have been. He's, of course, they, he hadn't at that time. He took them to a place that's called in, in Jerusalem, or just outside of Jerusalem, not too far. Uh, a place called the Shadow, the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And that guide told them, said, the reason they call it that, 
is because any part of the day you go through that valley, some part of that valley is in shadow. Matter of fact, I did a little more research on that and looked it up and found out that it was that that particular place was on the road to Jericho. Did anything come to mind? Remember the what we call the Good Samaritan? It is a possibility that it was that very place, that valley of the shadow of death, uh, that that, you, know, you remember that story? How that he was left for dead? And I thought, man, would that be, I'm not saying it was, I'm just saying, it, I mean, everything sort of lines up. But what I'm saying is, the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death, you say, well, preacher, is that just a one-time experience? No, what I get out of this is the, it's the whole journey, you see. You say, why do you say that? Simply because the time you were born, you began to die. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid tonight. I, this is one of my least favorite subjects to preach on, believe me. I, I, I don't, but, but I, we need to understand. Every one of us, or on this journey. There are three things that I, that I came, uh, that, that I believe in my heart the Lord gave me concerning these thoughts here. When David talked about the valley of the shadow of death, and we look at this as our journey, number one, it's the reality that we all have encountered. You say, what in the world do you mean as a reality? It's something that we all face. Every single day. Again, I'm not trying to be morbid, but it's something that we have to face. It's something that we understand that, and, and most of us think, well, that's going to be a long way away. Well, we just really don't know that, do we? And so death is something that we, it's a reality that we all have encountered. We've not experienced it yet, but we are encountering the thought or going through the valley of the shadow of death. We understand this reality that, that all of us, and you think, well, why? Why does man have to, have to face this reality? You know these things as well as I do, but I think it'll do us all good just to have our hearts refreshed and to be reminded of what God's Word says. The Bible talks about in the, in the book of Romans. It talks about where death came from, the beginning of it. It does have a beginning. Everything about man has a beginning and physically has an end. So we find in, in the book of Romans chapter 5, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. I want to tell you, it took me a long time to realize, why do I need to be saved? Why? I struggled with that as a teenager. I thought, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't need the forbidden, uh, forbidden fruit. I didn't do that. But you see, my federal head did. Adam did. And because of him, everybody that comes along in the human race is called a sinner. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, you have to talk to God about that. I'm just telling you that's, that's where it came from. Death came <coughs> because <coughs> of Adam. And uh, may I remind you that God told him, God told him in the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, do you remember when he put him in the garden? He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest there, ah, thou shalt surely die. God said you're going to die. Well that must have seemed foreign to Adam. I mean he hadn't been around, I'm assuming he hadn't been around long. He's enjoying life. He's, you know, sinless and uh, everything's fine. Well God said you're going to die. In the day in the day that thou eatest thou shalt surely Dying. Somebody said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Adam didn't die that day. 
Adam, because uh, uh, somebody said, well, I remember reading over in chapter 5 of Genesis, in verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Was God's word true? Did he die that day? Absolutely. Physically die? No. Spiritually? Yes. You see, you know as well as I do, death is a separation. Death, when a person dies in the physical sense, his soul and spirit are separated from the body. The body stays here. The soul and spirit goes, they're saved, goes to be with the Lord. And he died spiritually. He was separated from God. That's why God had to make a sacrifice. That's why God couldn't allow him to live in the garden, to eat of that tree of, that, of life. Because can you, after he sinned against God, can you imagine living forever in the body that you have now? And by the way, it would get worse and worse and worse. And so what Adam does, he dies spiritually. That's why the book of Ephesians says we were, here it is, we were dead in, the tres in trespasses and sin. See, some people don't understand that man was made in the image of God. That was, you said, what does that mean? Does that mean that God looks like me and I look like, no. That means that God is a trinity, uh, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. That means that a man is a body, soul, and spirit. God created man in his own image. But you see, the problem was when Adam sinned against God, his spirit died. His spirit died. That's the God consciousness of man. Your soul is your consciousness of this world and each other. His soul in that sin, in the strictest sense, did not die that day. He still knew Eve. He still knew uh, the children. He still knew, of course, he was under guilt when he sinned and, and, and spent the rest of his life, you know, uh, working and sweating and by the sweat of his face. And so what I'm saying is, Adam died because he sinned against God. And all mankind dies because we're all sinners. He died spiritually that day. That's why the Bible says, when a person dies without Christ, when he, when he leaves this world, that they... And, does not know Christ. The Bible says in, in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Second death is being separated from God. Think about that. So here you've got, here you've got the beginning of this thing of death. And every one of us that have come into this world and everyone I'm looking at, you have been born into this world. I don't think any of you are spooks. Now, some of you are spooky, but, <laughs> but no, no spooks here tonight. What I'm saying is uh, we all have experienced that. We have all had to deal with the reality that not only that we face physical death, but we face spiritual death. That's why we got saved. Amen. Amen. But you see, there's going to be an end to that death. I just read it to you. Death one day will be done away with. Think about this. I've got, I've got files at the house. Through the years, I've kept these files and sermons of, of funeral messages. And honest before God, I could not tell you tonight how many funerals that I've had party in all these years. But I've got file after file after file. And uh, I, every once in a while, I look through them. I look through them. <laughs> uh, Brother Howard, I was looking through some the other day, and all of a sudden, your mom's picture came up. She was a hoot. I told y'all, I know I did. Let me tell you again. She was sitting right back there on that first pew in the, at the break here, auditorium. And, uh, of course, she knew who I was. And I won't... <laughs> I went back there to speak to her. She looked up at me and said, Are you married? 
And I started laughing. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. I pointed to Linda, and she just laughed. I couldn't help but think about what a joy and the impact she had on your life and others. And, uh, I, oh, my, we could spend hours there, but I, I've got to move on. But, but it's a reality. Listen to me now. It's a reality that we all have encountered. I'm grateful tonight. Let me just say by way of testimony, I'm grateful tonight. I'm grateful that I've trusted Christ. And I, and, and I don't fear physical death. Now, I'm not too excited about it. I don't want to go that route, being honest with you. But if that's the way God chooses, that's up to Him. But I'm per I personally believe that if, if He wants me to go that way, He'll be there to bring me over the other side. And you've heard me say it many times through the years. I hope we all go in the rapture. I really do. But I see in that verse... I see in that verse the reality. Some people, that reality has, has never hit them yet. I was, thinking, I was studying on this the other day, and I, uh, the thought, uh, the memory came back to my mind uh, right after we got saved here, 1970. It might have been in 70 or 71, but Brother Jan Delaney and I were knocking on doors up in the, some apartment buildings in, in Riverdale. And so we would go from one building to the next, and, and, and in the process of that, we walked up on, and this guy was sitting on the, sta or the stairs of these apartments, and boy, was he ever spaced out. And uh, I spoke, and he looked up to him, boy, he was just wide-eyed and carried on, and I said, I told him who it was. He said, well, that's good. He said, man, that's good. And, uh, of course, I tried to witness to him, and I said, sir, I said, uh, if you died today, I said, where would you go? He said, I'm not going to die. I mean, he was serious. I said, you're not going to die? He said, no. He said, let me let you in on a little secret. All I got to do to keep from dying is just keep breathing. <laughs> really? I had him a gospel track, and I said, well, hopefully we can see you again. He wasn't in no shape to talk to. But, uh, but seriously, there's some, there's some people. They think when they die, that's just it. That's, they're just a, but that's not it. You know that and I know that. But the reality. But then in that verse, I see a rest that we can enjoy. I never saw this before in quite this light. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That peace. I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. A personal presence. That I didn't have. On October the 3rd. 1970. But on October the 4th. 1970. I had. <laughs> I had his presence. Thou art with me. He's personally walked. And you know this. This is common knowledge to us tonight. But oh how I pray that it will challenge your heart and mind. And stir us tonight. To understand he's with me. He is with me. The rest that we enjoy. No matter what we face. Thou art with me. Those, his personal presence, but not only his personal presence, but there's some powerful provisions in this verse. Two things. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Oh, these are wonderful thoughts here, and we, we all know them. We've, we've preached them before. We, you've seen it before. <clears throat> But I'm saying to you tonight that rod is a type or a picture of the Word of God. It's a type or a picture. And I looked over in the book of Ezekiel. Just listen to this verse now. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 37 says this. God said, I will cause, I will cause you to pass under 
the rod. He's talking sheep, okay? Passing under the rod was a picture of the examination that the shepherd would do with his sheep. He would count them. He'd, one by one, <laughs> they would come and he would use that rod in many cases and part their wool and, and he'd, he'd count them. And, 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 but, but under the rod, that, that was saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some time with that individual sheep and I'm going to examine him. Find out if he has any bruises or cuts. Or, and he would peel that sheep. And, and Listen, David as a shepherd boy, no doubt in my mind when he cried out, Oh God, he said, Search me, oh God. I believe he had the thought in his mind that God, as a shepherd, as he would come under the rod, that God would examine him. You see, all of us need examination. All of us. The Word of God is like a mirror, according to the book of James. The Word of God exposes us of what we are. The Word of God shows us our condition. And every day we ought to come under the Word of God. You see, that as I walk through this valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear it, God, that you, you're, personal, you're personally with me. Now you've given me your Word that you examine me with. You know, I'm not going to just, just take a moment here. But my heart for the last, oh, quite a while, especially in the last few weeks, has been broken when I see and sense the bitterness, the hatred, the animosity, the hearts and lives of people. I mean, it's there. It's, it's a reality that, you, that, I mean, it's there. But see, what you and I need to do is get on our knees before our, our Lord, our Shepherd, Come under the rod and say, God, search me. Do I have any bitterness in my heart toward anybody? Do I have any animosity in my heart? Lord, am I a racist? Say, whoa, preacher. Yeah, let's deal with that. Lord, am I? Do I think I'm better than anybody else? Folks, it's time for the judgment of God to take place in the house of God. Amen. That's what happens when we come under the word of God. And, and my heart cried, oh God, please. Please don't let me be that way. Please don't let me be full of hate. Oh God, please control my thought life. Please help me uh, in this situation. Lord, I need your word. I mean, you're with me, and your word is with me, and I'm walking through the shadow, uh, the valley of the shadow of death, uh, thy rod with me. It's a type of the word, it's a picture of the word of God. It's, uh, it's not only for examination, but it's for discipline. They tell me, I was rereading again, I bought a little old book. I don't know if you remember this or not, but in the 70s, you came. I had just got that Keller's uh, Shepherd's Look at the, 20, or at the 23rd Psalm, I think it was. Anyway, you remember, you, I remember you reading all the way back to the airport. I'm glad you didn't take it, brother. But he wrote notes. I'm telling you, I think he used it too. But boy, God used that little old book. And I was reading it again the other day. A shepherd shared his heart about being, you know, with sheep. And he, and he talked about, he, he said, he watched, and a lot of this was taking place in Africa when he was a missionary there. And he said he watched a lot of the shepherds there that take those rods. And uh, if, there was a, if there was an enemy or a uh, threat, they would, they, he said, I was amazed at their accuracy. I was amazed that shepherd would take that rod and, and man, you know that's what takes place every time we preach. <laughs> Are you ready for this? The shepherd takes his word. 
you're struggling with maybe with an issue and you you got this in your life and all of a sudden the shepherd takes that word right there and whew, hits you right between that right between the ears same thing happens to me thy rod thy staff they comfort me I'm so grateful tonight to know that his that his uh, rod of authority and we preached on this a little while I'm not going to take time to go over there in Exodus chapter 4 but you remember uh, God said to Moses what is in, in your hand he said a rod and then he took this rod and then it became the rod of God and it's a symbol of the I'm, I'm telling you it's a it's a provision of God powerful provision because why? Because we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The staff. I love this. I can think of no other profession that has an implement like this. The shepherd's staff identifies him. It, 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 uh, it's adapted especially to the needs of sheep. It's a, it's a symbol of concern and compassion. The author of that book I was just sharing with you said he'd seen shepherds, he'd seen other shepherds take that staff. That's the one with a hook on it, you know. He said he'd go over to a new, newly born lamb and take that staff. And See, God uses his staff to draw the sheep together. He said he'd seen that shepherd take that staff and run it up under the little body of that lamb and, and not, not putting his hands on to get his sin on the lamb, but that staff and he'd lay it over with its mama to get him closer. Listen to me, sheep. Every time we get together, God wants us to draw. I know we got to stay six feet apart physically. I understand that, and that's temporary. But I believe God's going to use this to draw us closer than we've ever been in our lives. It's a symbol. That staff, that staff was used. It's used for catching sheep. Sometimes, I don't know if you know this or not, sometimes sheep gets a little, they get a little ornery. And uh, sometimes he... Has to catch him. Well, what about so and so? Well, I'm just an under shepherd. He is the shepherd. You see, the, the staff is a, is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We've got the Word of God. These are the powerful things that He's placed in our lives, provisions that He's placed in our lives to get us through the valley of the shadow of death. Our journey. And sometimes sheep want to get away and he'll, oh, you know when he grabbed, he, <laughs> you know, you know when you step out of bounds, you know. You feel that tug of the Holy Ghost. I know I've shared this story with you before, but I shared this with my grandson. He, I, he never heard it. But I was struggling between that first, or after the first year of Bible college and the second year, we'd come down to work. And I, honest to goodness, we were flat broke. We didn't have anything to sell this time. And, uh, and so Linda went to work at the hospital down in Valley, or down in uh, the in Langdale. Alabama. And I was working in a little shop, Bob Boyd's. Actually, it was a garage, but he let me use it to do some body work, trying to make money to go back to school. And I shared that story about that man coming in I've known since I was 15 years old. Multi-millionaire. Owned a whole lot of Riverdale. And he looked around and said, what are you doing? And I told him the story. And he said, well, why don't you let me build you a body shop and supply it with everything and you know, we'll work out all the details. There for just a moment, 
That sounded pretty good. I'm as human as you are. But I remember when he walked out the door, and I thought, man, a life dream could come true. And all of a sudden, I felt that. I felt that staff. And that rod, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And those verses began to pour into my soul, and I fell in the floor. I was all by myself. And I began to beg God. I said, God, please, please forgive me. Please, Lord, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. I, I don't want even think it. And that's the that's the time we found out that Linda was expecting. And uh, I really didn't expect her to go back to Bible college. Honestly. Had time getting her there to start with. But I'll tell you something. God moved in, didn't he, sweetie? I'm so thankful that I got his staff. He, uh, he guides with that staff. And walking along with those sheep, he'll lay that, lay that staff up against her. If he doesn't want him to go, he'll lay it up, put a little pressure. We might ought to rejoice tonight that we got a God that loves us so much that he wants us to get, and we are going to get through it, through the valley of the shadow of death. I see the reality of it. I, I see that God gives us the rest in it. But I want you to notice the result. The result that's eternal. There's one verse that you better not miss in this verse. In verse 4, though I walk, yea, though I walk, what's that word? through somebody help me tonight what does that mean I, that means that we're not always going to be in it going to come out think about this now somebody asked me the other day I said what does it mean when you see a light at the end of the tunnel I said I don't know he said, they said well that means you're still in the tunnel <laughs> Listen to me. No matter how hard it might get, no matter what you might face, you're going to come out on the other side. Now, positionally, we already have. The Bible says in John 5 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed, here it is, but is passed from death unto life. Positionally tonight, I'm seated in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ according to the book of Ephesians. Mm. But one day, if God chooses this route for this preacher, one day, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from this body, help me out, is to be what? Be present with the Lord. Yea, that I walk through. I'm in that valley now. You're in that valley now. But we're going to walk through it. Please take this home with you. Death is nothing to fear. God's already defeated death. Matter of fact, Jesus has the keys. And as far as I know, if you've got a key to something, that means that's yours. Amen. And I'm here to tell us tonight that when we get through this thing, we're going to be with the Lord. <clears throat> At 1 Thessalonians 4, be with the Lord forever. Again, the psalmist says, David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. We 
we're going to be in the house for long. The results are eternal. Walking through. Shadows cannot hurt you. Shadows cannot hurt you. Now they sometimes will make you hurt yourself. But shadows can't hurt you. Let's pray together. Father, bless your word tonight. Touch your people. I don't know what everybody's going through, but I want to thank you from the depths of my heart for showing me this again, fresh and anew in my own heart. I appreciate it. I pray for those that are watching my live stream tonight that you'd encourage them. Lord, that use each one, each one of us to glorify yourself. We'd be, be quick to thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. All right, Brother Bill, if you want to take care of that.